You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. When it comes to animal bites, it's all about balance. You need to repair the defect, but you don't want to increase the risk of infection. You need to flush out the bacteria multiplying before your very eyes, but overly zealous pressure washing may damage tissue and possibly drive bacterial contents deeper into the wound. You want to be aware of the need for prophylaxis, antibiotics, vaccinations, but you don't want to overreact or overtreat or cause harm. It's hard to be so zen in the midst of this traumatic event for the patient, but I'd like to go over what we often see ourselves in, one of three scenarios. The first is maybe just a light grazing with teeth or fangs where the dermis is just ripped open and some wound care is required. The second is the most common where there's some tissue disruption, maybe even a small area of lost tissue, but it's still amenable to ED repair. The third scenario is major trauma. Large portions of flesh are removed. There's airway compromise or multi-system involvement. Today, we'll focus on what we can evaluate and treat in the ED with further expected management at home. If you had to choose who bit you, what would be your preferred ranking? Human or house pet? Maybe a cat or a dog or exotic animal? Here, we have competing concepts of likelihood and severity. Only 10% of all human bites in children result in an established infection. Dog bite infection rates are 20%. Cats easily infect their prey at a whopping 50%. So, good to know. In terms of frequency and infectivity, it goes human least infectious, then dog, then cat the most likely to infect. However, when we talk about severity and infectivity, another pattern emerges. Human bites are the worst in terms of morbidity. So least likely to get infected, but most likely to cause a serious complication or failure in outpatient therapy. Human bites can include streptococcus, fusobacterium, staphylococcus, peptostreptococcus, A human's signature dish is Iconella and Haemophilus. These are particularly bad infections when they establish. But as we know, human flora can contain as many as 50 species of bacteria. Polymicrobial is the norm. One special circumstance to mention is the fight bite, or the closed fist injury. Whenever I see any small, little, tiny puncture or abrasion on the hand, especially over the knuckles, I ask, man, how did that happen? The more vague the answer, the more likely it was a fight bite. So I follow up, bruh, bad vibes. Was it, I don't know, so bad, the pain, maybe maybe you soothed it, maybe you put it in your mouth, you know, to help you feel better. I'm not looking to get anybody into trouble. I just need to know if saliva was on that wound. Why do you ask? Clench fist injuries happen when a closed fist makes impact on another person's tooth. It may leave the tiniest of marks on the surface, but there's often injury over the dorsal aspect of the third, fourth, or fifth metacarpophalangeal joints, usually over the third MCP. It really is a small, benign-looking puncture at first, but the tip of the tooth penetrated the soft tissue and possibly the extensor tendon and sheath, maybe even the MCP joint. 
the estimate is that your tiny little nothing puncture wound over the third metacarpal penetrates the MCP joint in up to 60% of cases. Big yikes, bruh. The extensor tendon and MCP joint are relatively avascular, and so they can get infected very easily and travel up the tendon sheath, resulting in high morbidity. Cat bites can be nasty too, with pastorella being a big problem. Another nasty bacteria in a cat's mouth could be Fusobacterium or Streptococcus, Bacteroides, Staphylococcus, Moraxella, Propionobacterium. Pastorella infections cause a lot of inflammation and fast. You'll see pain, edema, erythema, and brisk spreading within 12 to 24 hours of the bite. Compare this to a typical staph or strep infection that usually takes a few days for the erythema and the swelling to become bothersome enough to seek care. Dog bites happen a lot. In fact, it's the most common animal bite to children, typically in the preschool to early school age group. They are the least infectious and luckily the least severe. Dogs can carry pastorella, but the inoculation quantity is so much less than in cats. A dog's mouth also carries Fusobacterium, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Pe Peptostreptococcus, kind of similar to a human's mouth. The signature dish for dogs is Capnocytophagia cani morsus. The subtype literally is cani dog morsus bite. In other words, when humans bite, they don't always infect, but when they do, they are the most interesting biters in the world. Human bites are the worst, often resulting in abscess and hard-to-treat infections. Cats mean business. They infect readily at 50%. That infection can become significant, but often we know the bug, we know the risk, and we have good therapy for it. Dog bites are common, but their bark is much worse. They infect about 20% of the time, but the infection is often milder and very amenable to therapy. Humans bad, cats still pretty bad, and doggy, that's a good boy. Johnny is at Susie's birthday party. Lots of people and uh, the usually sweet schnauzer snaps. Johnny is wailing, partially from the bite on his forearm and partially because this was so sudden and unexpected. The betrayal. Lots of commotion. There's a rush drive over. And here is little four-year-old Johnny scared of everything now, not the least of you. This is the context. Your super skills of establishing rapport quickly will be challenged. You recognize the recent trauma and upset. You speak softly with mom and dad. You slowly make diagonal paths closer and closer to Johnny as you talk to mom. Let him get used to you. You gain his trust. Have mama and he take off the bloody hand towel they wrapped him in, and you see a long laceration to the posterior aspect of his right forearm. It's hemostatic. There's no obvious tendon, nerve, or vessel seen. You praise Johnny. He's been brave. So now what? Mom and Dad are already 10 steps ahead of you, and you can feel their questions, their anxiety, their expectations rain down on you before you're even able to open your mouth. Now is the time to broadcast equal parts compassion and command. They need someone who will listen and who will understand. But in times like this, someone who will have a plan and make it happen. You get them into a room as soon as you can. You limit the number of staff coming and going. Early analgesia. You size up mom and dad and Johnny. They're calmer now and they're focusing on whatever they can do to distract Johnny. They are allies in this process. You can always do sedation, but 
with a bit of systemic analgesia, distraction, local anesthetic, and a careful approach to the wound, you think we can get there. We like to use topical anesthetic gel. It goes by different names. Let in the U.S., lidocaine, epinephrine, tetracaine. Lat in many other places, lignocaine, adrenaline, tetracaine. It's a gel that melts at body temperature and gives topical anesthesia just a few millimeters deep. For lacerations just deep to the dermis, you can apply this, cover with an occlusive dressing like tegaderm or IV site dressing, wait 20 minutes, and you have a pretty nice needle-less anesthesia. For deeper wounds, you can then use your typical topical needle injection of lidocaine or lidocaine with epinephrine to get deeper anesthesia to that wound. In this, in this case, the let just helps you to inject without pain. As an aside, there was an idea floating around in the literature that maybe if we just kept reapplying coats of let paint at 10 minute intervals, maybe we can forego injectable topical anesthesia altogether. A nice randomized control trial by Simbita et al. found no difference in pain scores between the two groups studied, one that was given let to dwell for 30 minutes and the other that had three applications of let every 10 minutes. So use it once. It's good. Give it time to work. Okay, now that you have sized up the scene, you've determined who can be helpful, who can be supportive in this therapeutic environment, you've got analgesia and the local anesthesia on board, it's time to wash out that wound. This applies to really any laceration that you'll encounter, but the stakes are higher here. We need to do great wound care to wash that out and potentially to breed any of these animal bites that you see because there's a real possibility of a serious infection developing. Ideally, we want a fresh wound, a new wound, within six hours of the event, perhaps up to 12 to 24 hours for the face, and then we still want to irrigate it copiously. How do we know this? How do we know the numbers, the hours, the cutoff that's always cited? Well, let me take you on a brief journey into medical advances during wartime. During World War I, battlefield medicine took a big leap forward. The Army Medical Corps became very organized. They had field hospitals, evacuation hospitals, medical center hubs. At the battlefield hospital, they could control hemorrhage, they could splint fractures, they could dress wounds, they could do quite a bit of first aid. And the soldier would get, yep, a painting of iodine, some very basic wound care, they'll get 500 units of the anti-tetanus serum, and one-fourth grain of morphine. A grain is an old unit. Uh, it's equivalent to about 60 milligrams. So that's a pretty good slug of uh, at least 15 milligrams of morphine. I am, of course, and maybe a blanket and a warm drink. That was the mode and the speed at the field hospital. Those with more serious injuries would be shipped to one of the main hub hospitals, often taking hours or days to get there. The soldiers had to be stable enough to make the journey, or there was uh, expectant management in the field. So a well-organized system for a terrible time in history. An interesting pattern soon emerged. The stable but significantly injured patients started dying not of their injuries, but of terrible infections that they got in the trenches. It took quite some time to get them to the hub hospitals, and it's hard to give ongoing care en route. Those whose wounds were treated right in the field, where it was thought to be dirtier, they actually did better, even when they had significant tissue damage. Why? Oh, you know what I'm about to say. They got their wound cleaned and definitively managed earlier, right on the spot, within hours. So the fancy-schmancy ivory towers were no match for Johnny on the Spot, ready with copious amounts of irrigation. What to use? Sterile saline is just fine, but 
so is tap water. A prospective double-blind randomized control trial by Weiss et al. in the British Medical Journal showed that water is a safe and effective alternative to sterile normal saline for wound irrigation before, surgery, before suturing. After analgesia and wound anesthesia, feel free to have the patient run his or her wound under tap water while you prepare. How much to irrigate? Well, you'll see different ranges, but a good rule of thumb is 100 mLs per 1 centimeter of linear length of the wound. Now, it's better to have more irrigation than less, so go to town, but think 100 mLs per 1 centimeter. It gives you a good guesstimation of how much you're going to need. You're always reevaluating the wound and making sure it's still hemostatic, that you've cleaned out any debris, but 100 mLs per 1 centimeter of linear length of wound. So, Getting back to Johnny and the schnauzer bite, you get a better look and you see that there are two puncture wounds and one three centimeter tear deep to the dermis. It's hemostatic. There's no apparent tendon injury. So you calculate 100 mLs per centimeter. I'm going to need at least 300 mLs to irrigate this and more is just fine. But leave those puncture wounds alone. Why? Puncture wounds are a deep well. You are only going to shoot debris and bacteria into that wound, make it edematous, and at best, do no good. There really is no egress for the effluent. The water just is not going to drain. Don't bother with the small puncture wounds, the kind where you can only see the puncture and you can't see any underlying tissue. The linear lack, however... Get comfy and get ready to shoot. How much? 100 mLs per one centimeter of sterile saline or tap water. Okay, so we have our fluid. How do we irrigate? What do we use? How much pressure to use? In the ED, we use low pressure but high volume irrigation. So less than 15 pounds per square inch, 15 psi. More than 15 PSI is used in the operating room just because it's sort of hard to tolerate. For example, to pressure wash terribly infected wounds while the patient has general anesthesia. So that's not our goal here. We're going to aim for about 8 to 10 PSI. But how do we get there? Well, we know that the smaller the syringe, the higher the pressure. So you could take a 5 ml, 10 ml syringe and keep filling and keep shooting and get a pretty good PSI, but it's going to take you quite some time. So let's be practical. If you take a 35 ml syringe and attach it then to a 19 gauge needle, a nice little small uh, outlet, maybe it's a 19 gauge needle or it's a tip shield device, with perfect conditions, you'll get 20 PSI. There's a little built-in buffer here estimation because Maybe my PSI, maybe not your PSI, but you still have to push it like you mean it. So how much pressure do you put on the syringe piston? Well, first, of course, use eye protection. Also, the commercial built-in irrigation shields are great. But take your 35 ml syringe with your 19 gauge needle, load it with water or saline and depress the piston firmly and steadily. And it should take about three to five seconds to empty it. Another way to gauge how much pressure to put on the piston is to use yourself as a cheat sheet. If you put your thumb on the tip of your nose and depress the soft tissue to the cartilage, that's about 8 to 10 PSI. So at least that much pressure should be coming out of your 35 ml syringe. And if not more, just give it a little more oomph. Okay, so you've used 100 mLs per one centimeter laceration, at least eight to 10 PSI, and you get a really good look at the dimensions of the wound. Don't add iodine. Don't just pop a few holes in a saline bottle, squeeze and hope for the best. Do it the same way each time so that you develop a systematic evidence-based way to irrigate that wound. After all, this is the most impactful thing that you could do for this patient. Just to follow up a little bit on what I mentioned about iodine, I was always taught that iodine is not to be used in acute wounds because although it is a great antimicrobial, it's also cytotoxic and it delays wound healing. 
there is some more recent, some good high quality data to show that it probably doesn't really delay wound healing that significantly, but it remains a known irritant. It's really meant to be used on superficial wounds, not deep wounds. A thin layer of betadine will remain in the wound for days. You may think to use it in a very superficial, dirty wound, for example, like a cut sustained in a septic tank, for example. The risk to benefit ratio is pretty good here. But iodine shouldn't be used routinely. And if there's no infection present at the time, the benefit actually fades out. But you're left with the potential for harm and ongoing inflammation. Think of it this way. If your hands were dirty and you had you had to choose between a little soap glop and a steady stream of water, would you choose a little bit of soap or would you wash, wash, wash until it's as clear as a mountain stream? Wounds need copious irrigation. There is just no substitute for that. So when in doubt, wash it out, wash it all out, and then wash it again for good measure. Now that you can visualize the wound better, ask yourself, could there be associated fractures or maybe a foreign body or maybe I need to do some plain films? Feel free to x-ray anything other than the superficial animal bite. You can be surprised by what you see. One special consideration is in small children, roughly preschool age and younger. They have a few things going against them when it comes to bites. First, they have more soft tissue and cartilage than they do rigid structures like ossified bones or a defined musculature. Basically, they're soft little mochi balls that those fangs can really penetrate very easily and readily. Second, because they're smaller in comparison to the animal's mechanism to the teeth and jaws, a larger swath of the child's body can be affected all at once. That said, in small children, especially less than three, significant bites to the head, face, or neck often will need CT scanning. We can verify depth, other vital structures, evaluate for concomitant skull fractures. It's just another reminder that these are trauma patients, and the default in trauma is that there's typically more than just one injury, or at least until proven otherwise. All right, no open fractures, all is well, now what? You may be tempted to say, hey, this is a dirty wound. I numbed it up. I washed it out. What little there is still in the wound may linger, fester, and cause a big problem if I close it now. And that is true. Nothing is guaranteed. We can't be 100% certain for everything all the time. So back to our goal of balance. Another way to say this is risk benefit. If there's a three centimeter wound to the child's forearm, to the dermis sustained five or six hours ago, after anesthesia of the wound, irrigation, exploration, maybe you just leave it alone. It's not gaping. All of the supporting structures are doing their jobs. The pro to delayed primary closure, as we call it, is that you optimize the chances of not developing an infection. The con is that the patient has to come back, has to be seen again, the wound has to be reanesthetized and repaired. For children, this can be especially anxiety producing since they just want to get past that terrible, awful, no good day. There is still a role for delayed primary closure. So waiting for that window of time for the infection to happen or not happen. It's typically within 48 to 72 hours. You don't want to close up a burgeoning infection, but at the same time, you don't want to leave someone hanging literally. But I mostly reserve this delayed primary closure for people who come in just a day later. Obviously, they're not even on the fence. They come in very late and now there's really no rush to fix it. You may want to explore the reasons for that delay in care, but truthfully, this is most often an adolescent or adult who may or may not have been under the influence of something at the time, woke up, realized something hurt, and he or she is there to see you now. I worry a little bit about 
how closely a sutured wound would be monitored. And I err on the side of safety in these delayed for no great reason, but now in a rush to get some stitches crowd. I prefer to numb it up, clean out that wound, dress for comfort, and have them reassessed in two to three days. If it's going to get infected primarily, it will have happened by then. And on day three, if the wound looks clean, you can reanesthetize, rewash out, maybe see if there are now little bits that need debridement and do delayed primary closure. So early wounds, no problem. Just close them up. It's okay. Granted, it's not the best thing in the world, but neither is getting bitten and having a huge gaping wound that needs anatomic repositioning. Please, though, please resist the temptation to use cyanoacrylate or dermabond or medical superglue. You want that wound to drain if there is early infection. There is some evidence to support worse outcomes with the use of cyanoacrylate. In the borderline delayed cases, you size up the situation. It's okay to close in some cases, trust your judgment, and especially if there is that anatomic disruption we talked about. For example, a new patient comes in, and it's Susie. Hi, Susie. She's the six-year-old at that party, and she likes her ponies, and she likes to put on a show, and she was having so much fun pulling on her neighbor's dog's tail until he barks. She turns. He bites her on the calf. There is a six centimeter stellate lack to the posterior calf. For six year old Susie, this is a pretty big part of her calf. So you have mom put on her favorite show on her smartphone. You give her good systemic analgesia, good wound anesthesia, wash that wound out very well, and you repair. You accept the risk of repairing this animal bite, but knowing that it is just too distressing to leave it be. So you focus on meticulous wound care to try to mitigate that risk. This risk, though, I think is relatively small with good wound care. The major pro to repairing now is that you instantly have Susie functioning again. She can bathe again. She can sleep again. She can walk. She can sit down. All of those things she couldn't do before she came to see you with her gaping wound. After good analgesia and wound anesthesia, as we mentioned, wound irrigation is the most important thing to do. If you wash it out, the body will heal. Now, wound repair by us is meant to provide comfort, stability for the wound, and really reduce healing time. But even if we did nothing other than irrigation, it would heal. So let's talk about some things that we can do to help that patient heal faster. I use non-absorbable sutures because that wound needs to be evaluated again in five to seven to 10 days. And we need to get that foreign body out. Now is not the time to try to be fancy with absorbable sutures to avoid a second visit. All animal bite wounds in children need a follow-up visit regardless. Do what you can to avoid deep sutures with absorbable thread. You don't want to leave a foreign substance in that wound, which will then have a proclivity for infection. But again, on balance, if the tissues are so deformed, so gaping that you need tissue support in the deeper layers, then you got to do what you got to do. Just avoid absorbables as much as possible and err on leaving them out whenever possible. As long as there's some anatomic stability, Absorbable sutures are best left out of bite wounds. I would rather do my superficial repair with deep bites with a non-absorbable suture on the surface, really getting maximal purchase with that needle. If there is crushed or macerated tissue at the wound edge, it needs to go. If it doesn't bleed, there is no need. That is, the wound margin must have a working microcirculation or there's just not going to be any healing at that edge. The point of wound approximation is to have both sides of the wound talk to each other and say, hey, I like you. Let's work together and build a bridge of new tissue. So how and why does that happen? Minor nerd alert. 
epithelial injury starts a complex cascade of damage-associated molecular patterns called damps. Okay, now we're getting a little deep. These damps are called danger molecules. Who says lab science isn't fun? Okay, these damps are released from dead and dying cells, and they promote the inflammatory response. So that includes NADPH oxidases, phospholipases, arachidonic acid, all those funny little acidonic acidies. <laughs> so we get rid of that dead tissue for that reason. After we clean the wound and bring the tissues together, they send other endogenous signals that, hey, we need to build a bridge over here. These signals are growth factors and cytokines, together called chemo-attractive cytokines. I mean, if you've got to be a cytokine, why not be an attractive cytokine? They signal neutrophils to clean up the residue and fibroblasts to start building a rudimentary matrix for wound healing. This is all a local event. If the two sides of the wound are not brought together, it's a missed chemokine moment. Dead tissue at the wound margin, use your iris scissors or scalpel and carefully debride. The old advice of loose approximation is probably not worth it. The old idea was that if there is an infection that might happen, a loosely sutured wound can drain better and avoid an abscess. I would make the opposite argument and say that if you've irrigated well, you've inspected, you've debrided when needed, then you should give those two star-crossed wound margin lovers the best chance that they can to really make it. With good wound care, you will catch a brewing infection, but give the wound a chance to heal. It's better to approximate and let your body's innate system work for you rather than against you. Now we come to the part of the story where there's a villain that turns out to be a hero, or at least in part. Antibiotics. Loved by many, feared by some. Now, of course, most non-bite wounds don't need antibiotic prophylaxis. Again, fall in a sewer, get a lack, sure, you can have the antibiotics. Maybe you have a deep cut on a coral reef. Great, there's good reasons for that. But those will be exceptions. Typically, we don't give prophylaxis to non-animal lacerations. However, there is good evidence to support antibiotic prophylaxis to animal bites. Not superficial, superficial scratches, but anything you would consider repairing. Now, I say this with a bit of buildup because sometimes in medicine, we pick our battles in a weird way. People love to point out a distinction without a difference. It's what academic dreams are made of. Anyway, I'll give you the official and then the practical recommendation. The following wound characteristics have a good evidence basis for giving prophylactic antibiotics. Wounds of the hands, face, or genitalia. Any wound near any hardware, an orthopedic injury, for example. Significant crush injuries deep puncture wounds. And of course, for anyone with any kind of immunocompromised, diabetes, cancer patients, transplant patients, rheumatologic patients, those with poor mobility or vascularization, there is also good evidence to give prophylactic antibiotics to patients in whom you just had to do primary closure. And there, my friends, is the best argument for giving prophylactic antibiotics to animal bites that you've just sutured up. It's okay. There is an evidence basis for this. So that's a pretty broad picture. Most people, we repair by primary closure, and that's one of the recommendations. There is weaker evidence for prophylactic antibiotics for wounds that are older than 6 to 12 hours as well. This topic, of course, is ripe for a Cochrane review. Cochrane's meta-analysis concluded that there is marginal evidence for prophylaxis of dog and cat wounds, except for those on the hands. Well, we already knew that hand bites were higher risk, but to me, there are just too many variables to pull apart, and the risk-benefit ratio should not be thrown by the wayside. The risk of infection is low, 
but not insignificant. Five to eight percent in most cases, especially if we're talking about dog wounds, the most common. You don't want your animal bite to get infected. And for sure, you don't want your patient whom you just sutured to get that infection. So you've heard the official line and now here's mine. Just do it. Give the dog mentin. Give the amoxicillin and clavulinate. The only downside is maybe some diarrhea, but think of how freely you give augmentin otherwise when the stakes are lower. For outpatient oral regimens, amoxicillin clavulanate, augmentin, it covers anaerobic and aerobic bacteria, the aerobic bacteria like strep, MRSA, pastorella, echinella, just to name a few. It also covers some of the anaerobes like prevotella and others. As an alternative, you can also go for Bactrim and Cephpodoxime. For inpatient IV regimens, ampicillin sulbactam, also called unison, is a great go-to. You can also use piperacillin tazobactam or zosin. Penicillin allergic patients can get ceftriaxone and clindamycin. Just one more plug for irrigation. Without essential wound care, analgesia, local anesthesia, copious irrigation, possible wound debridement, no fancy drug on earth will clear this up. Basics are not just simple, they're essential. One last villain to talk about. Everyone always worries about rabies. Now, this will depend on where you work. In developing countries, this is a big deal. It's nearly 100% fatal once contracted. You'll want to refer to your local health department about what animals are higher risk in your area. It's not worth trying to commit a list to memory because the epidemiology can shift. I do want to give you a good overview to have something to hold on to. So first, if you don't have fur, you can't get rabies. This is a mammal's disease. So you're not going to get it from a mosquito, from a spider, from a gecko. None of those can give you rabies. Some mammals are very high risk and you just treat. Some are very low risk and you don't, and some are in between. In this high risk, low prevalence disease, we're not really talking probabilities here. We're covering for possibilities. We're not trying to get it 100% right. We're just trying not to be wrong. That's to say, over treatment is just fine. Bats, treat it. Raccoons, fox, skunks, do it. All of these guys are high risk animals at least here in California. I can say that because most of our dogs are vaccinated. But if you're working in a developing country, for example, stray dogs have rabies until proven otherwise. Okay, the low risk animals for us are those homebody pets like hamsters or guinea pigs. They wouldn't hurt a fly. <laughs> Even some Wild animals like squirrels or chipmunks are usually low risk, but again, that can change by the year and location. Intermediate risk are dogs and cats. Stray dogs, just go for it. A dog with all of his vaccinations, however, is going to be low risk. So you can see that this is not so cut and dried. My advice is that if this is a family dog or cat and no one is particularly worried, it was a provoked bite. I'm looking at you, Susie. The dog is acting normally and the family can watch the dog. Then you are good. Stray dog, stray cat. We don't know. The neighbors are angry and fighting with each other. Any concern, just do it. Realize you're probably over treating, but that is okay. So what are we talking about? For any mammalian bite that is anything other than low risk, we should give both rabies immunoglobulin as well as start the vaccine for rabies, the series. The idea is that you want to neutralize the virus locally with the immunoglobulin. Remember, rabies is very slow to progress. You have time, but the decision that you make in the ED set a patient on a certain trajectory. So it's okay to just go for it and give 20 international units 
per kilogram of rabies immunoglobulin and do your best to give as much of that quantity as you can into the wound and around the wound. You're trying to set up an Ig moat around that bite. If you can see no discernible bite, for example, the often cited scenario of you wake up in a room and there's a bat in it, then you just give that whole thing I am into the lateral thigh. It hurts on injection and can cause some inflammation and soreness hours later. So we give the immunoglobulin to mop up as much as we can of the virus, and that will hopefully hold until the vaccination we give at the same time starts to have an effect. Remember, most vaccinations require two to four weeks to enact some immune response. The regimen we use in the U.S. is the human diploid cell vaccine, 1 ml IM, typically in the deltoid area, one each on days 0, 3, 7, and 14. It's a commitment. It also is a bit of coordination since the patient needs access to a place that has the vaccine. And in today's world, that usually means coming back to the ED. So remember, uh, you want to give the immunoglobulin far away from the site where you give the vaccination. Otherwise, the immunoglobulin's job is to deal with that little particle and it may end up canceling each other out. The immunoglobulin and the vaccination series should be started as soon as possible. But even if there is a delay in coming to see you, just start it. Fortunately, rabies has a long incubation period, about 45 days. So I'm not saying take your time, but that is the evidence basis for some recommendations that you may see to capture the animal, observe it, and find out what its hopes and dreams are, and then quarantine it for 10 days. And sure, we, we just don't have that luxury in the ED. We have to make a decision right now. Um, all I'm saying is, if it's unclear, it's not crazy to wait, especially if you have someone else to pass that baton to. But I'm just telling you that we're so often in that position where this is not feasible or anxiety is too high. We make decisions at this point of care and these can have reverberations into the future. The rabies butterfly effect. So if there's any doubt, bite the bullet, start the series. The moral of the story is, be nice to animals. If they bite, then our ideal care is cleaning out the wound with copious irrigation. We wait 48 to 72 hours to close. We get good follow-up, all that good stuff. But practically speaking, what happens almost all of the time is that we are washing out these wounds. We're assessing the risk benefit ratio for primary wound closure. We most often close them. We give prophylactic antibiotics because we're closing them or for other reasons. We're updating tetanus as needed. We're assessing for rabies and we're ensuring follow-up. Dogs bite a lot, but the infection rate is relatively low. Cats get you bad. Make sure to give antibiotics for deep cat bites and puncture wounds. Humans don't always infect, but when they do, it can be really bad. Also, just look at the hands, ask some non-judgmental open-ended questions, make sure you assess for tendon injury, fight bite style. Irrigate with how much fluid? 100 mLs per one centimeter of linear wound. And then how much pressure? 8 to 10 PSI. Make sure that child has good follow-up. And most importantly, this is the time to treat the child and the family as a whole. Size up the situation and tailor your care to what they need and what will work for them. It will go a long way to an effective partnership and successful outcome. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.